When we got to know that you were willing to give us an interview, we thought it would be a good idea for me to go and meet you and get to know you. But when I came, I found that the circles around you were very closed, that it was a very exclusive group, very oh. difficult to reach to you. Does it have to be this way? It isn't always that way. We, we got up at 6 o'clock this morning and had two plane flights, and I was feeling awful when we landed, just nasty. So we just got in the car and left. We didn't mean to be rude or exclusive. There are times when you have to be. I feel as though I need that around me, because if I look at anybody, I'll just be rude. You know, instead of saying hello, how do you do? I'll say get out of my way. So that was all. That's and, I'm, and there isn't time. There wasn't time. I had time to wash, lie down, get ready, sing a song, and that was all. So we'll get to know each other in the interview now. Yes. Do you find that in these days of, of disco music, rock and roll music, that uh, young people still like the traditional folk song and the con contemporary ballad? Um, I don't sing myself too much of tr too much traditional stuff, but I think there are people around whose ears are tired of hearing too much noise. I also think there's some very good noise and there's a lot of not so good noise. And um, most of the not so good noise is what's on the radio a lot. And uh, I think sometimes that, that for a lot of people it's a, it's a relief to hear something a little bit more quiet and calm down. Yeah. It's my opinion. You're now doing a European tour. Do you find that music taste is different in Europe from the U.S.? I don't really know because my repertoire in Europe is limited because of the language barrier. I mean, for instance, I've written a lot of new songs, but I can't really sing them um, freely and where I don't feel as though people pick up all the words. I think it's too much hard work for them. So um, my own repertoire is altered considerably in Europe. So you sort of have a tailored repertoire for the European tour? Well, that, right, each time, yeah. Each time it changes it some. From country to country? Yeah, sure. Yeah. For instance, there are certain songs that I know have been popular in Germany and France and Italy that I, that I don't think are even known here. And, and I wasn't here long enough to find out if there were special ones that people would know. And there are people there who gave requests, so that, that helped out. You are in Norway very much known as a political activist. Now that the Vietnam War is over, how do you look upon your role as your political involvement, the role as a political activist? Well, my role as a political activist started long before the war in Vietnam, so it kind of makes it easier for people to see it more clearly to understand that. It wasn't because of the war in Vietnam that I became a pacifist or an activist, that my father and mother were on anti-nuclear ban the bomb marches in the 50s, and that was my introduction was because they were Quakers, pacifists, and then my introduction to more radical nonviolence came through Ira Sandpearl, who was traveling with us again this time, and um, and it somehow was really there from when I was very little, but I didn't begin to verbalize it until I was in mid-teens and then late teens. And now the only difference is that this certain direction has been taken away from people. But there's an article in the Herald Tribune what, two days ago saying that there are more demonstrations in Washington now than there have been in years and years and years. I mean, everybody, there's not that one focal point of Vietnam, but there are the women and there are the, I mean, absolutely everything, minorities of all shapes and sizes, and, and, and people are on the move, and it's kind of getting to be not so true anymore that people say, oh, the universities are dead and quiet, and they were quiet for a while because I think everybody was in a state of shock, but I think they're coming out, and nothing changed at the end of the war in Vietnam. I mean, everything's as bad as it was, really, you know, no real altered state of consciousness because this terrible war was over, so there's, it's not as though the work is over. Work is maybe just starting. Mm, I'm coming to that okay. question. <laughs> okay. I've sort of had to have them lined up for you. It's all right. Well, uh, and one reason why I, why I ask this question is because on one of the records, one of your records, Carry It On, you say that you refuse to be looked upon as an entertainer. Mm. You still do that? Well, there are times that I like to entertain. I mean, just make people happy or make people feel good. But very seldom would I like a whole day, a whole concert to go by without having made a little jab somewhere. Because there's nowhere in the world, in my opinion, that's really got a right to sit back and say, we're totally satisfied, everything's in terrific shape, and now I can rest, you know? Because there are so many sad and terrible things going on, from hunger to torture to more subtle exploitation. And, and to me, 
it always goes back again to Gandhian politics, that the, the root of all of that is people's willingness to ignore violence that goes on and in that way continue the violence or to directly take part in it under the name of some, you know, some glorious name or some glorious new cause. And um, until that mentality is changed, or unless that mentality is changed, then I don't really think the human race has a very big chance. How about the feminist movement? Do you think that fighting for women, women's rights is that part of your general political involvement? I haven't gotten very involved with that. Um, it's partly because of the, a lot of the fashion in which it was done in the States for a while I had difficulty feeling comfortable with. Um, I think I've, my consciousness has changed a lot from, from that. I mean, I've benefited from a lot of what, what's come out of that. I had problems with the style. A lot of it. I wouldn't say I'm a feminist. No, I'm a, I'm a person first. And women get very angry at me for that, you know, for not saying that I'm a feminist. I think it scares the hell out of men to, for women to say they're feminists. And the men are so scared to begin with. There's no point in having both sides <laughs> feel absolutely trampled on. But I don't know, once I just felt if you could t we could teach men how to cry, we probably could end war. <laughs> you know, simple little things like that rather than... But there are some fan there were some fantastic things that have come out of the feminist movement as well. Last question. Uh, most artists are put to the, you know, the threat of commercialization. Do you think that you have avoided this threat so far? Um, I don't know. I've, I think the only mistake I ever made was bothering to listen to my record company. You know, that, that I, that when I thought, well, I'll devote a little more time to my records and my music because I thought I owed it to myself and to my own music, etc. So therefore I thought, I connected that with listening to the people from the record company, which was foolish because all they don't really listen to music. I mean, they listen to the accounting machine. So I sort of got past that phase now and got back to where I want to hear exactly what I want to hear coming out of myself and my soul and my words and so on. Mm -hmm. You started writing quite late. Yeah, I didn't start writing until about, um, I'd been singing 10 years before I wrote anything. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't. I'm still so nervous. I don't know. I don't have an impression of it. <laughs> well, you can listen back. It'll be fine. Don't Thank you very much.